That's what unions are about, in my view, about providing dignity and respect for people who bust their neck. That's why I created the White House Task Force on Worker Organization and Empowerment, to make sure the choice to join a union belongs to workers alone. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, Amazon, here we come. That was President Joe Biden in the beginning of April expressing support for unionizing. In fact, the Democratic Party has a deep history of supporting U.S. labor. Dating back to the 1970s, the party supported propping up the backbone of the U.S. workforce, America's workers. We are a long way from those times, of course. Fresh criticism of the party suggests they've left workers hanging out to dry, but continue to play the, quote, underdog in favor of the working class. Now, our next guest, Russell Dalton, is a union tradesman, and he's written this piece for Newsweek, pinpointing exactly how Democrats have been doing the working class wrong, left them without a political party. Russell, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Russell, in your op-ed, you write, quote, our bread is buttered maintaining the coal-fired, gas-fired, and nuclear power plants that scatter this country and provide the only reliable sources of power to keep our iPhones and electric cars charged. Yet as a citizen who casts this ballot like everyone else, I keep asking myself, who represents our interests? To put it succinctly, no one. Can you elaborate on that for us? How have Democrats abandoned the working class of late? Well, they abandoned them back under the Clinton administration with the signing of NAFTA. And ever since then, they've facilitated the wholesale, basically scrapping the country for parts, which really started back under the Reagan administration. And basically just to keep, from, for no other reason, just to keep the market pumped. And so because growth really ran out in the system back in the mid to late 60s, we've really had to really reconstruct our, like, our companies to basically externalize our cost on society or at the cost of the employees. And so kind of 40, 50 years of that has really transitioned the entire economy. And so what the biggest problem facing labor is that, you know, the number of factories in this country are a fraction of what they were and the nature of employment is different. And so like by way of example, what's the difference between What's the difference of me getting paid twenty dollars an hour, eighty dollars an hour to go fix a power plant? It's not sixty dollars an hour. It's one tenth of one cent per customer for a week. Mm. And so, the, because that kind of work is gone, the kind of work where the increased cost of labor can be distributed broadly in the system and absorbed with relative ease, you know, labor is in a real tough fight because, like, the working class today. I mean, it really is the you know, the barista with a master's degree serving coffee who can't get a job. And so, you know, to counter from my example, what's the difference between her making $12 an hour and 30? Well, it's the difference between a cup of coffee going for three bucks to eight or nine. That's untenable. And so we just keep moving forward and far, further into this path of like basically entire peasant class who can't afford anything. And they can't, and the nature of their work can't afford anything like approaching respectable wages. But what do you say to people who point to the huge gap that's emerged from the mid part of the last century to now between the average worker pay and the average CEO pay who say, well, that most certainly some of the problem, much of the problem is rooted in these trade deals that disadvantage the American worker and sent so many jobs over, overseas. But also part of it is that you have um, CEO to worker pay ratios that are in excess of 300 to 1 Whereas at a more profitable time for workers in American history, where there was greater union density, it was 30 to 1. How much onus do you put on kind of the extractive, hyper-exploitative kind of system of capitalism that has emerged in a kind of post-regulatory era? Well, I mean, it, I think it's huge, but I don't think it's quite the story that it is. You know, it's like Amazon. I think they have some kind of policy where like it's, they limit to like 30 or 40 to 1, something like that. But they make up the difference by just giving these big like, wheelbarrow fulls of stock options to their management. And so they can preach that, you know, there's all these ways, there's all, management has all these tricks around all these things. And so while this, the, you know, this, the, the sticker cost of like, oh man, 300 to one is pretty bad. And it is bad. And now, I mean, it, and it's, and they're, they're 
their reasoning behind it is all is pretty clearly self-serving. You know, so well, we won't be able to attract a you know competent manager without being able to pay them. You know, three hundred times what the peasants are getting paid, and you know, and the people who actually do the work as well. I mean, management doesn't really do much. I mean, they got to make decisions, but they're not the ones swinging the hammer or mopping the floors. And so, the, yeah, the extractive the extractive cost of management is significant, but. I mean, this is more of a systemic issue, it seems like to me. You, you say this reality has left you politically homeless, and you know, you've talked about how you're dissatisfied with the direction the Democratic Party has taken. So, I mean, what about the Republican Party? Obviously, they have, uh, it, it, rhetorically at least, tried to make a push for working class voters. But is, is that all it is? Is it just rhetoric? Oh, sure. I mean, they're, they're, they're playing the same get game that they played in the 90s. You know, it's, you know, the Christian right of the 90s and the aughts and the progressive left of today are the exact same thing. You know, they're, they're both laundering this, you know, neoliberal economic model, corporate, corporate and globalizing interests under the culture war. And I mean, that's, that's, that's the game that's being played. Well, what would you like to see coming from the White House and from Democrats in general? What would you like to see them saying differently, especially going into a, a midterm season where I think lots of folks would like to capitalize on all of the um, kind of labor uprisings that are happening across the country with the Starbucks unionization, uh, you know, popping up all over the place, obviously with this huge Amazon victory. Are people, are working people seeing the Democrats as more responsive in a meaningful way? Are they seeing that there's a meaningful difference in Joe Biden being in office and the NLRB following up and, and, and all these claims that Amazon has behaved improperly and illegally in the context of these elections? Is that enough? Is Joe Biden's rhetoric enough? Or would you like to see certain other specific kinds of behaviors and promises being made in the context of this campaign season and beyond? I mean, that's a pretty good question. I mean, talk, I mean, you know, talk is cheap, you know, I mean, so AOC sure talks a good game and now she, and she's, she's sharp. Um, and then, he, you know, it, and then when come vote time at the fulfillment center and was it Staten Island, I think it was, mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't show up, but she's very happy to show up to the Met Gala or anywhere else that she seems fit. So back in, as soon as Joe Biden got in office, there was that miners' strike down in one of the southern states. I think it was Alabama. Mm -hmm. Bessemer, Alabama. Yeah, oh, the miner strike. It, yeah. Yeah, it was one of those southern states, and you know, he didn't show up. He, I mean, he may have paid lip service, but you know, it's like you got to show up, and you actually got to make your effect known and felt, and. You, Oh, yeah. Ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you're right that a lot of people, including Chris Smalls, uh, who you know was leading the protest, they were critical of AOC for not showing up. She subsequently did reach out to Chris Smalls and has showed up along with uh, Bernie Sanders and some others to ongoing uh, organizing efforts in the area. And he, you know, I think Chris Smalls would, would say you put the pressure on, you criticize the people and then they respond and you're happy that they responded. That's the point of criticism, not to necessarily um you know, you know, hang them with their mistakes for the rest of their lives. But it is interesting that there, to me, that there's not necessarily a clear understanding of what substance of support looks like, other than showing up at these picket lines, which of course is meaningful. But it is also easy to kind of co-opt, I think, which is the point that you're making. And it's not clear how mm. much of that support is going to manifest into real returns for workers down the line from a political perspective. Ooh. Oh, yeah, certainly. You know, Twitter's not real. Tweeting support is not real. You know, like, and the fact that, you know, she, so, I mean, not to pick on AOC, no disrespect to her personally, but when you, when she couches herself in this working class dress, and then, you know, has to be called out when she kind of goes some, like, that's the, that's a problem. You know, the fact that she has to be criticized and then gets to show up and then can somehow try and spin it to look like a hero is, I mean, it's, it's all, I mean, politics is all a game. It's all a game. And so it's, I mean, and, you know, so like the piece I wrote was pretty vitriolic, but in, you know, we got to kind of understand the position that our politicians are in. I mean, they're being pulled in a million different directions and the problems and the problems they're facing that we are all facing in the country are so monumental that, and then no one really knows what the hell to do. Mm. You know, education doesn't work. Health care doesn't really work. The economy has been stagnant and basically contracting for the last 50 years. I and mean, what the hell do you do? Yeah. 
It's a good question. Well, we're trying to discuss that <laughs> every day yeah, on no the kidding. show. And hey, I'm not smart enough to figure it out either. Yeah. You know, but it's like you kind of look around and it's, you know, the system works very well for the top five or ten percent. And it works incredibly poorly for the bottom 70%. And there's that middle 10 to 15% that's really struggling. You know, that that up that 70 to 85%, they mean they're living a very precarious existence in this country. And I mean, it's, it's kind of making everyone go insane. You know, it's like everyone just kind of feel the noose getting tightened around the neck in this world. You know, and like the supply chain issue doesn't really seem to be getting solved anytime soon. Well, Russell Dalton, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you very much. Sure appreciate it. We'll have more Rising right after this. Stick around. Stick around.